everyone. I hope uh, you hear me and you are, you are, everybody is doing well and fine and good. No one has have, is having any problem with health and with anxiety or anything else. Um, so my topic is on the Save the Frogs. Uh, what was that? Ecology, ecological value or ecological importance of of uh, the frogs, right? Um, I'm glad to hear that you are you've been involved with the campaign for Save the Frogs since 2012. I've started campaign for the frogs since 1995. Okay, mm -hmm. and so part of this material presentation here that I'm showing you now is a revival of those materials that I have done in frog protection advocacy where we visited several schools. We used uh, the, the LCDs and the other projectors, the newly pro uh, invented projectors were not yet uh, in use then. So we had uh, black boards, no? uh, black and white boards where I pasted those pictures. In fact, part of those materials are displayed, still displayed at the Museum of Natural History here in UP Los Baños. And um, thinking that this is not just a scientific presentation, but it includes literary and arts, um, it comes to me, it deems to me that it is just appropriate because I was also two years, that was last year, no, uh, 2018, I was the keynote speaker of the interdisciplinary humanities fusion of arts and science in our college here. I was invited to put together um, the consolidation or conglomeration of arts and um, science working together for a more holistic approach toward um, awareness of our natural resources and science, uh, scientific uh, materials for a more effective understanding by the people because you know when you go into literary and arts you don't simply touch the minds but you also touch the heart you touch the emotion you come into you touch a deeper level of understanding and you enliven what to some others is uh, quite some people find science boring although it gives me life science is always uh, um, an energizing uh, material for me, but if you incorporate or integrate science and arts, it finds itself into a beautiful form. So here is my some of the initial materials. I, I bring you into opening the world of amphibians. Okay, and um, yeah, this was part of I had several students and assistants coming up to work with parts. This is not the whole material. No, I just got some special parts of that campaign material that I used in, in 1995 onwards with uh, students, teachers, and other common people so that they could understand the importance of the frogs. And uh, to bring you further onwards, I have here uh, created a, an icon whom he, I call Oka. Actually, it's Oka Palaka, no? Uh, although he, in his icon here, it's Koka Palaka. His real name is Oka Palaka. Or in English, I call him Oscar the Frogs. And he represents all Philippine frogs. And yeah, as I said here, he will take you to their moist, beautiful, interesting, but threatened world. So, hi, Oka. How are you today? Okay, so here is my outline. Um, I have a little introduction, general backgrounds on the frogs, and then some Philippine, Philippine frogs, and then uh, what can we do as a community, as an entity, as a group of people, or even as individuals. No? There are things that we can actually do together to save the frogs. And yes, I have also added here something very personal to me because I compose them. I do some poetry also. Let me just read. I don't have my, I couldn't find my Tagalog poem. The 
song I have not played for a long time, so I cannot be very confident about its tune now, or its melody, but let me just read this. I made this about the special frog if, of Palawan, endemic only to Palawan. One is a Barbie song, which goes like this. Barbarula is the only genus of the threatened Busuangensis, the only Palawan endemic species. In the world, only two of them exist. Barbie in Palawan, Chom in Kalamantan, rare and special with a round tongue. Like fish, they live in water all the time. Tadpoles have gills, adults have no lungs. They love the bubbly flowing waters, clean and clear and undisturbed. Since their heads and nose are on their heads, they swim and stay completely in the riverbed. That was supposed to be a song, but I forgot the tune. So pardon me for that. My other poem is about a campaign or a cry of the Barbarula. This is the same. Barbie is the Barbarula. No? Uh, there are only two Barbies in the whole world, the Barbarula Buswangensis and the Barbarula Kalimantanensis. So this is my little poem. We are happy in Kalinaunau River, Chinabayan. Please don't collect us or destroy our river home. We love the bubbly water so rich and so safe and rich in fun, comfortable and cozy, fitted to us, so cool and calm. Oh, we love the trees around us, tall and quietly shading on. Like a secure umbrella, it protects us from the sun, gently filtering the water flow from the head source coming down. Flooding drops, racing streams, and rains that pour from hen. Although Kalinao now River is a small, it has a fully loaded aquifer. Fountain head out springs from the groundwater with pure clay uh, from ground under with pure clean water. Providing homes, sustaining life with food and friends together, the crabs, crickets, and smaller ones now and hereafter. Our species mates were present in Irawan River in Palawan. Sadly now, some sites have dried, disturbed, and so are gone. Bulalaka Falls is a special place where they swim with great fun. We hope they still remain there safe, secure, and calm. Okay, so this contains scientific information and data, but it is expressed in a literary piece. One is a song and the other is poetry. So you can put them together, okay? It is not because it's an art, it cannot be scientific anymore. But it's not because it is artistic, it cannot be, uh, I mean, it's not because it's scientific, it cannot be artistic at all. They can be together and they can be bought, brought, uh, no, used together to enhance each other, okay? So I, I also have this piece of little anecdotal material I got from, from a friend in Lucen, Alukban, Quezon, in Mount Manao. Oka's first story is about a tale of long ago, of long time ago in a place called Banahao, which is a mountain in southern Luzon. It was told when God was creating a different section of the mountain, he used three seeds and threw them down to earth. Now, while the seeds were falling down, each one was transformed into a monkey, a man, and a frog. See, that was the beginning. And then when the monkey, the man, and the frog landed on the soil, God said their presence will determine the type of their home. While the monkey landed, came the tree, where the monkey landed came the trees and jungles of the forest ecosystem. Where the man landed came the rice fields or the agro ecosystems. And where the frogs landed, there came the streams, rivers, ponds, and springs of the aquatic ecosystem. So you have ecosystem types already, you know. Our ancestors recognized, even in their folklore, the important inhabitants of the aquatic ecosystem as represented by the frogs, you no? Know? But of course, these are just the representations. There would be fishes and other things in those river systems. But of course, the water is necessary there in the inland freshwater systems of our places. Now, what are amphibians? Oops. Okay, amphibians are frogs, toads, Sicilians, newt, sirens, mud puppies, and salamanders. And they are generally with soft and moist skinned animals. 
and their life cycle is composed of a life spent on water and a life spent on uh, the soil. No? Um, as an egg, they need a body of water to sustain them. And as an adult, they are either in trees or on the soil on or, or in the grasses. But most of the time, they are very near bodies of water. This is the reason why they are called amphibious, meaning they have double life or biphasic life systems. Their life cycle is composed of a time when they are totally dependent on water as when from when they are frogs until they are tadpoles. And then half of that life system is spent as uh, adults out of the water. In the water system, they use gills for their respiration. They are totally dependent on the water bodies. Without the water, they are going to die. Okay, They cannot get oxygen because uh, their gills would need the water system by which they could get their oxygen. But as they develop into adults, they lose their gills and then they develop their lungs. So they can both respire through their lungs and their skin because their skin is definitely made of so soft, moist material that facilitates um, respiration, you know, um, the exchange of gases between the body system and uh, the environment or the ecosystem. So here is just a closer picture of their life cycle. An adult frog would lay an egg and that egg should be in the water and then it should develop into a tadpole and all of their life as a tadpole, they would be in the water. Okay. And then when they grow older, when, once their lungs develop, then they go to the land and they stay there. They mate, they feed, they grow and uh, do their functions as frogs. You know, they are very, very important in the ecosystem, both in the water as well as on the land. Now, here are just some types of uh, eggs that I, I, I show, I'm showing here. A typical egg would have an outer envelope, a vitellin area, and an inner envelope. And uh, these are the different types, some of the types of frogs that um, we have, although these are foreign frogs, uh, examples in general. You know, we have a lot of them in the local areas, especially in the rice fields, but not only in the rice fields, you can even find them hanging on trees because we have arboreal frogs. You know. uh, as I said, amphibious are those organisms with double life cycles. There are more than 4,000 species worldwide, more than because a lot of new discoveries have, have uh, come about. And so this is just a basic ap approximate. They don't have amniotic sacs. They are called anamniotes, meaning um, they don't have that protective sac covering the egg. That's why they have to lay their eggs in water. With amniotes, they have a, an amniotic sac. They, found, they are found in the eggs, like for example, in the eggs of chickens or in the eggs of reptiles or even in, in the uterus, no? the embryonic sac or amniotic sac. They, their naked uh, skin is moist with mucous glands and they have four legs most of the time, no? although um, ichthyopids do not have legs. A special worm-like amphibian called ichthyopidae do not have legs. Okay, how many frogs do you see here? So there are their bodies make them highly sensitive to the quality of atmosphere. Uh, how many frogs do you see? <laughs> but they they can they. Uh, can be good environment indicators because they are sensitive to the conditions of the environment. Their skin is the one that makes them oversensitive. Uh, there are frogs and there are salamanders and newts. These are also amphibians, no? But we don't have them here. The, the newts and salamanders are not naturally found in the Philippines. We only have the frogs and the ichthyopids. 
these ones, if we might see them, you find them in Cartemari, you find them in areas, uh, the, the places where animals are sold for pets and these animals are imported. No, but um, the ones that we have would be the anurans or the or the frogs, no, the tailless amphibians. And then where did they come from? There is, uh, it has been known that they come from Ichthyostega, a large um, uh, amphibian whose fossils were found in the rocks of Greenland. And it has been known to be a large um, amphibian that has developed legs to get out of the water and start invading the land. The theory of evolution is that everything started, of all life started off in water. And uh, since they are water, most of them are fishes. But later on, life had to invade the land systems. And so there were the first uh, animals that came to land and the first one would be the frogs, you know? and then the frogs evolved and produced the reptiles and the birds and the mammals also. Okay, so as I'm, this is just a backgrounder. So after 100 years, the remaining closest relatives of the Ichthyostega were classified into three classes. The Labyrinthodontia, believed to be ancestors of the reptiles, the Leptospondyli, an evolutionary end which became extinct, and the Lysamphibia, which is uh, recognized as the ancestor or the continuing ancestor of the extant frogs or the living frogs. Now, the general body forms of frogs would be classified into four. Arboreal, those are found in trees. They have sticky legs that can allow them to hold on there on branches and they will not fall. And then you have the semi-aquatic frogs. They live uh, near water systems, but they are not necessarily over-dependent on water systems, um, except at the egg age of the eggs of their life and then the terrestrial they have more time spent on land and only like the rhinella marina this is the wrong scientific name or rhinella marina would lay its eggs on water but most of the time it would be on the land okay and uh, the sheramadrensis is a terrestrial you'll find them among mosses very near the river, very near wet areas, but um, in fact, they lay their eggs and small bodies of water like in the leaf axils because they don't have tadpoles. They develop, they go through direct development. They don't have tadpoles in their life cycles. So they just lay eggs in small pools, clean water, and then that hatches into tiny, tiny froglets without undergoing the tadpole stage. And the burrowing frogs are examples of the Kalula baliata and the um, Monticola, okay? Frogs are diverse. They occupy many parts of the environment and play scientific specific roles in the food web. Okay, they serve as natural control to post populations and uh, they also serve as food to bigger animals. Um, they can also feed on smaller mice and snakes and snails. That Rhinella marina is a bad invasive species and it has already reached the high mountains. That's terrible. No, it should not be there because this is from South America. And it was introduced to the Philippines in 1954 because the people there who were not so aware of its possible impact is that they could be used in pest control both to eat rats and insects. Now it has become one of the most problematic invasive species of the Philippines and in fact the whole world. They have invaded the whole world. They have um, spread already parang virus, no? but it's, it's spread over a long period of time. 
uh, they have been brought here to feed on insects and other pests, but they eventually became pests themselves. Now, as food, uh, gourmet is what you call the special frog food types, no? And I'm, I'm not sure if you have tasted fried frogs or adobo frogs. This is... Uh, Examples of um, a restaurant, not in the Philippines, but in uh, Thailand, no? And this would be Hydrobatracus rugulosus, okay? It's a large frog. It has reached the Philippines also. We have them in our rice fields. And um, it is also an introduced species. And it is relatively bigger than our, our local limnonectes. Okay, so that's how you, 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 have you tasted frog barbecue? There you are. That's a delicious frog barbecue and delicious frog, a fried frog, okay? Parang fried chicken. So why are frogs important? Again, they play a very, very important role in the um, trophic web, trophic chain, trophic web. They, they feed on smaller organisms to balance populations, but they are also food to bigger organisms to sustain the bigger populations, also the bigger size populations. No? So snakes feed upon them, birds uh, would feed upon them no, where, while they feed on smaller organisms. They can feed on smaller snakes also or worms, no? they are sensitive to uh, conditions of the environment also. When they disappear from where they used to be plenty, the place had changed badly. So this is how is it, how it is, no? Um, once the frogs are in a happy mood, it means, or their populations are in good uh, size, uh, in good, um, yeah, size. No, then it means that the water body where they live, where they thrive, is clean, relatively clean because they are able to survive there. But once that water body gets polluted, the only frog that I know that can survive on disturbed and semi-polluted waters would be the, the rhinella. No? Their eggs can thrive on... Uh, almost semi, but not the thoroughly polluted waters. The eggs will also die. The oxidosiga can live in mud pools, but those mud pools are not the polluted mud pools. No? They should be clean mud pools, and the oxidosiga can can lay their eggs in those mud pools. So ibig sabihin, they are choosy when the environment and the ecosystem is over dry or over polluted or dirty, you won't find the frogs there. An example of a place where I have visited that has no frog is Itbayat Island in, in Batanes. No, there are no frogs there. Why? Because that island is a long, elongated island. It is thoroughly dry. It's very, very dry. So frogs will not be able to exist. Of course, there are snakes, there are uh, reptiles, but no frogs. And then they also are sources of some pharmaceuticals, um, some maybe potential sources for cancer and AIDS treatments. And in the past, and even up to now, they are sources of poison. No, um, There are studies I know that are using the the parotid gland of the rhinella marina trying to find out the extracts and looking at how it can possibly be useful uh, but in among natives of south america the poison dart frogs or the dendrobates are used they get the frogs they get the skin and then they put it in sharp um, things like this and darts, as you call them, and it can actually cause either the death or uh, the blackouts no? on, on a person who is stabbed with, with darts, having the poisoned uh, extract from the frogs can lose consciousness no? or even can even die. Okay. 
So frogs are definitely very useful. But here, they are also used as important specimens in the laboratory. I'm sure nag-zoology one kayo. No? You took up zoology one and you have dissected a frog. Maybe. No, this is a general course, GE course. And thanks to the to the Barbarula or uh, to the Rhinella, I mean, um, we now use them fresh. No, we catch them, bring them to the lab, and dissect them. In the past, in my time as a student, we <coughs> did not have much of the Rhinella. We would have a big frog, and then we preserve it in formalin and alcohol. And then that is our frog for the whole semester. This time we don't preserve them that way anymore. No? And for every topic that we would like to do dissection, the rhinella are just available outside. You capture them and open them up and you, hola, you have a fresh cut frog. Okay. And they also played a role in traditional culture and folklore. If you would remember the story about the frog prince. Kiss the frog and find your prince. Diba? You know that story maybe. No? Um, <clears throat> because of the kiss, the, the frog was transformed into a prince. And they ended happily ever after. Yeah. So the distinct features of the frogs would be these ones. They, are, they have their legs, their back, they have an external nearest, the external ear, and then you have especially my folds on the skin. This is the groin, this is the anus, and then the body length is measured that way. No? Uh, and then the mouth parts are studied in my class in herpetology, the internal nearest, the vomering teeth. And then you have the tongue and then the glottis and then the hands generally have four fingers while the feet have five fingers which may be webbed or not webbed and uh, this is an example of the limnonectes how it is measured that is measured is not vent length and then this is uh, the top uh, this is the uh, inguinal region no, and that is the uh, dorsal dorsolateral fold. This is the tympanum, and uh, this is the dorsum, and yeah, this is the interorbital distance of the frog. This is the the throat. No, you can distinguish a male from a female in most frogs by the color of the throat. Males would have a large, a darker one, and sometimes they have uh, vocal sacs here. And that would be the transparent nictitating membrane of the frog. Um, oops, and yeah, this is the chin and throat. And that would be the mouth or the labio, labium, labia. And yeah, this would be the elbow. And this would be how the hind limb would look like. There are numbers here because you can identify frogs by numbering them or numbering their digits. Okay. Now the forelimb, as I said, generally have four fingers. There they are. And uh, yeah, this is just to point out that that is the digital pad. Okay, and that would be a nuptial pad. This is usually found in males. When they are mating, the nuptial pad, pad is swollen and sticky. So it, this, is help, this helps the male clasp into the female so that their amplexus can be more successful. The, the female doesn't manage to run away. And that would be the palmar or the palm of the frog. And where do the, the frogs live? Many frogs live in places that uh, should be clean, cool, and cool, and um, mm -hmm. more or less undisturbed. No? Uh, for example, these uh, Stauroys, Natator, would be living in, the, although they are rock frogs, you find them on top of the, of the rocks most of the time when they are happy and relaxing but once they are disturbed they jump quickly into the water 
they spend most of their time in these places. But these sh places should be shady and uh, with clean water. Some frogs have also used uh, trees and tree holes. No, uh, they can, if there is water in here, the frogs can lay their eggs there. Uh, if there is water in, in, in the axilla of this fern, then the arboreal frogs can lay their eggs there. Okay, but there are also burrowing frogs, as I said earlier. You find them under the uh, leaf litter. Okay, um, again, that area should be cool and a clean place, meaning um, what I mean with clean is unpolluted place, you know? but that would still be, they would be thriving in the soil under the uh, fallen leaves and they would even lay their eggs by the, in the mossy areas. So the forest habitat and clear waters are the most important habitats for this species. Some of them do live in rice fields and fish ponds too. But when frogs disappear from where there used to be many, uh, where there used to be many frogs, it means that the place has become worse or polluted. Frogs don't survive in polluted or dry environments. Okay. So the life cycle, I have already told you earlier, no? they lay eggs, they become tadpoles, but not all have tadpoles because some of them undergo direct development. Mostly the platymantis undergo direct development. The others would have the regular tad, uh, egg tadpole and ad, sub-adult and adult life cycle. Now, uh, how do they mate? These are the ways by which uh, mating is called amplexus. No? And these are the different ways by which they can mate. No? Um, they can be glued. They can be uh, axillary, they can be inguinal, they have cephalic, or they have um, what's this uh, clasp to each other. Okay. So why are frogs noisy? Most of the frogs they become noisy during the mating season. Once the rain, in fact, they become noisy first before anyone else notices the rain. Because when the rain comes, di ba, alam nyo, the moisture changes. And they detect the change in the moisture and in the change of the temperature. And once this happens, that would indicate for them their mating season or the rainy season is coming. So they start being noisy. Now they produce different noises by species so that they come to search each other in a, in a pond by voices okay uh, if there are men they are many then they would recognize this is why you have a rope you have a croak you have your reap you have redip you have bone you have a croak no you have a tweet and you have a tweet 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 or, so those are different types of uh, frog sounds which are recorded we already have a frog library of sounds that help us recognize them even if we don't see them just by listening to their voice sounds. No? Um, these are either mating calls or advertisement calls. And this is either to find or to, to set up a territory. Who is noisy in the frog, the male or the female? Just the male. The females are quiet. Okay. The males have uh, voice uh, sacs. No? And yeah, they they make yabang. They make uh, they <laughs> they express territoriality. Try to drive other males, or they advertise themselves. Hey, lady, I'm here. The, he sounds off. The, and so the lady would listen, and the first lady who would like that voice is going to him, and they can mate. No, the the lady makes the choice the the male displays himself by his sound he shouts of hi i'm ready i'm poggy i'm i'm ready for mating you know and then the lady listens and he said i don't like that sound no i'm i'm not going to do that and he'll find another but somehow some way some other lady would 
okay, let me have that. I go. So she'll jump there and then they'll meet. Okay. And then the distress call is sometimes they use, sometimes they pretend they are big, their sounds are big enough. You know the Kalula, I don't know if you have heard the Kalula pulcra, is, which is another endemic species, uh, introduced species, the pulcra. Is this the one that sounds like a cow? Moo, moo, moo. Have you, have you heard that? And they think they can scare you away with that sound because it's big, no? But they are just this is small. Nang litlit nila. But they try to scare you off and say, Moo, I'm big, but they are tiny, small. And I would say, Okay, I don't need you. You invasive, get out of here. So that's you know, they try to escape, but you know, when, when they are not necessarily in the place where they should be, then get rid of them because they are not there um ano to, naturally, no. They are bad. Now, the release call sometimes also, a uh, release call is made by a male or a resistant female when classed by a male who mistakenly classed another male or a female who has already released its egg. So, let me go, let me go. I'm the wrong, wrong frog. You, you are holding on to a wrong frog. I just released my egg. No mating for me again. So, or let me go, let me go. I'm male too. I'm male. So get out of me. Yeah. So it, 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 it sounds off that way. Okay. So some trivia. The biggest frogs that we have in the world would be the Conraiwa Goliath of Africa, which is about 30 centimeters long. And this is eaten. And then the world's smallest frog is the Silophryni didactyla of Rio de Janeiro, about 10 mm long. So this is centimeter, ha? this is millimeter. So that's, that's just one tenth of the one thing. In the, in the Philippines, our biggest frogs would be the Rana Magna, which is about 50 to 150 mm. And the uh, platymentis pygmaeus, which is about 14 to 16 mm, the size of a 10 centavo coin. So this is relatively small. And then, as I said, global amphibian diversity goes beyond 4,000 species the whole world. So Coca tells you, hi, I'm native. I'm your friend. I'm promoting save the species movement. Okay, I'm your guy. Okay, I'm shouting and saying, let's save the frogs because they are my friends. Okay, so you have uh, 10 Philippine amphibian families in two orders, and this would be the um, these two. No, we don't have the salamanders and newts in the Philippines, we only have the Sicilians and the Anurans. Okay, this is order Gymnophiona and this is the order Salientia. There are recently 116 species counted as of 2021. This is not 2016, but as of 2021. The Ranidae and the Ceratobatrachidae are the largest uh, in numbers of uh, individuals or in the numbers of species. And I have several students who still have who have done their thesis, who have graduated, but who still have their frogs to be described and to be identified. Yeah, they are still being studied because these are new species out there in the areas where they have collected the frogs. So this is our biggest frog, the Limnonectes macrocephalus, and this is one of the, not, this is not the smallest one, but this is Platymantis. Acorugatus. So just to share, this is an adult and this is also an adult. Just to show you the diversity of the two different frogs. So you have the families of Ichthyopidae, Bombinatoridae, Buffonidae, Ceratobatrachidae, Dicroglossidae, Eleutherodactylidae, Megophidae, Microhylidae, Ranidae, and Rocophoridae. Okay, about 116 species. Now, this is a summary of uh, what we have in, in the publication of Jesmos et al. in 2015. 
So nadagdagan na ito, there has been added species to this. But again, I would like to emphasize that we have one critically endangered. There are 15 endangered species of frogs. There are 29 vulnerable frogs and there are 12 near threatened species of frogs. So you have to take note of them. The endemicity of our frogs is very, very high. That's in 2015, it's 93 over 113. Now, this is my favorite frogs, the Barbie. That's why I wrote a poem about them. You find them only in Palawan. Uh, and they are mostly all the time found underwater and happy in bubbly running water. So, ang cute cute niya. Tawag, I call it Barbie. Found only in Palawan region. The scientific name is Barbarula buswangiensis. And it is a disco There are only two Barbarulas in the whole world. The Barbarula Buswangensis in Palawan and the Barbarula Kalimantanensis in Borneo. So this is just a run through, a quick overview of the frogs that we have. These are toads, no? This is our native um, frog. This is not a uh, bufo anymore. This is Inguerophrynos philippinicus, and this is Rhinella marina. No, these are my Ansonias no, of Mount Apo. Found only in Palawan, found only in Mount Apo, found everywhere in the whole world. This is invasive species. Okay, so. You have the Leptobrachium there. You have a Megophrys. These are ground litter frogs. This is a uh, Megophrys also. Okay, very distinct uh, horns in the upper eyelid. And then, oops. This is Staurois natator. This is Limnonectes and this is Platyman. So I'll just run you through these pictures. I won't discuss um, any of them. So just to show you that they are beautiful, they are interesting, they are diversified. They live in various types of habitats in the Philippines, but you have to find them, you have to discover them, and you have to protect their habitats. That's how beautiful the frogs are. And they are important environment indicators. Once you destroy their ecosystem, they die. And once they die, they can become extinct and you lose your high levels of endemicity of frogs and you don't see them anymore. You'll just see them in books and you will also be destroying the environment. You don't have uh, organisms that will feed on small invertebrates and they may overpopulate in number and they can become another problem. These frogs are found in various habitats in the Philippines, and they help a lot in balancing the proper population sizes of the various organisms in the ecosystem. So these are the chorus frogs, the noisy ones, where you will have the Kalula pulcra. This is Kalula picta. Look at the beautiful uh, dark or the chevron patterned um, drawing at the back or mark at the back and it looks like a human being. So these are what you see of the frogs. So why are frogs threatened? Many frog populations around the world have gone or have declined because they are, they lose their homes, their habitats are threatened and ruined. How? You have cut the trees, your mountains are calbo, no? Good. Now, they are also evicted by introduced species, just as those that I have said, mentioned earlier, the Rhinella marina and, uh, and others like the Kalula pulcra. And then there's another one, the Eleutherodactylus planirostris. No? And they are over collected for food. And aside from cutting the trees, pollution is one bad way of destroying the habitats. Let us all be conscious with the, with the pollutants that we create. Are we also conscious about the chemical pollutants that we produce or do we simply throw them into the um, water systems? 
Now, we should be very careful. How do you manage your batteries? How do you manage your uh, chemical mixtures in the lab? Are you conscious of how you are doing them? Because every pollution that you throw away to the environment is a threat that will affect the frogs. If you really love the frogs, you have to, you, you have to change your own lifestyle about pollution or solid waste management. Put that into mind, no? because it is very important. The world is aware of extinct and endangered frogs in many areas. And these are the pictures of the various frogs. No? And this is an example. This is a picture of the Conrawa Goliath. No? Ganyan siya kalaki, oh. Di, ang sarap, mas malaki pa sa manok. No? So you have the red-legged, the yellow-legged, no? the harlequin. The golden, uh, uh, these are, um, this is the Conrawa Goliath, and then these are le leopard frogs, or even you can have this um, Dendrobates, no? And then you have the glass frog, ang ganda-ganda niya, you can see its internal organs because it has a transparent skin. Because of the chytrids no, that came and attacked the temperate regions, many of the frogs have become extinct. And that is called the chytridiomycosis uh, infestation. You know, a lot of frogs became extinct in these present generations because of the chytrid fungus that attacked their skin and caused them to die. So what is the DAPT, the APTF and the GAC? Now the Declining Amphibian Population Task Force was engaged as early as 1995 and I was active in that. And we also did the Global Amphibian Campaign to promote monitoring and conservation of amphibian populations all over the world. In fact, there are also even recent campaigns and there are more organizations now that are, that are conscious about the importance of using the frogs as frog, frog ship species for conservation and protection of the environment. 1990, the IUCN uh, created the DAPTF and uh, to look into the phenomenon of the disappearance of amphibian species. And this was their objectives are to determine the geography and extent of declines and disappearances of amphibians and assess their phylogenetic distribution and determine the causes of these amphibian declines and disappearances that have been detected. And for sure, it was the chytrid that has become the main cause of the quick and immediate um, loss of populations leading to quick extinctions. But the habitat destruction is a continuous negative effort that has served to threat the frog populations continuously. By 1998, the Conservation International, the CI, the FFI, and the IUCN made a joint initiative to promote the GAC or the Global Amphibian Campaign to accelerate the study on amphibian diversity, build understanding on the causes of amphibian declines, slow down or reverse the global trend of amphibian declines, maintain habitats in their and uh, maintain amphibians and their habitats worldwide, and use amphibians as, as flagship for broader diversity and conservation teams, and capture the interest of public to their beauty and importance. I hope my early presentations of the various frogs of the Philippines, these are just representatives, has attracted some of you, you know, that there are really beautiful frog species in the country and we should be paying attention to them. Now, in the Philippines, there are a lot of threatened frogs too. And uh, recently, I am a member of the Philippine Red List uh, Committee and we identified the threatened frogs or the threatened amphibians, the threatened reptiles, the threatened uh, birds, the threatened mammals, plants, and even invertebrates. And we have published a book, the Red Book, recently. And this is where you find the list. And I have only shown the pictures here of the frogs that we have as identified as critically endangered, the Platymantis insulatus. So there are active groups and active people working on the protection of the frogs. 
uh, in the Philippines and even in a global scale. So what can we do to protect them? One, we can protect their homes. Let us not destroy the forests. If you have moist forests or mossy forests, then let that forest remain moist and uh, mossy and uh, with full canopies, no? undestroyed and undisturbed. If they live in water, we should not pollute their ponds. You can see this. This is a clear body of water. You can see the, the tadpole swimming there. So that means this is a clean area because you can see the tadpole swimming. You know? Other things that we can do, let us not over collect them for food or pets. Do not allow introduction of us of the new species. If you can see the new species and you have nothing to use for them, kill them. We may use the introduced pests, but don't, don't, I know, don't just kill them and kalat them, no? Kill them and dispose them properly, no? Baka lalo pang magka-infection yan sa paligid. If you kill them and then leave them there and then they will rot and then they can cause the death of the dogs or the cats or even some, some people, no? So dispose them properly. We may use to introduce pest species for lab specimens, just as we are doing the Rhinella marina. And then we can also build clean ponds in our gardens, which can become our home. No, but first of all, let us learn to appreciate them. Anyway, even if they are not attractive to you, no Philippine frog has ever been harmful to anybody. Yung iba kasi nadidire, kasi daw, ee, ganun. Ah... Ano to, madulas and malamig yung gano'n, ano. But, yeah. Um, we should be able to appreciate them even if we don't like them. Now, only the Rhinella marina has poisoned dogs and other local organisms. It is introduced from South America. You may join the campaign by relaying this, is his, this is story by Oka Palaka to your family and friends. So when we protect the home of the frogs, we protect the other wildlife homes as well. Okay, so that's still Oka. I am parang si, si Oka. No? Oka is really our campaign guy. No? So let us protect our frogs or wild plants and animals while we still have them. When we stop finding them, they may be gone. And when they become extinct, their extinction is forever. If we want to keep our frogs and other wildlife as a whole, we should protect the environment. We should help in conserving our forests by telling our elders not to cut down the trees. You can also help by tree planting. And we should teach the young children, lalo na kayo, kasi college students kayo, you can influence these little boys from elementary. Do your campaign. Go and tell stories to them. Tell them how important the ecosystem is. Dance with them, sing with them, poem with them, write with them, move with them, and capture their heart and tell them, let us protect the environment because this is what is going to sustain our future. The old people will be gone sooner or later and we will remain. So let us do this for your future. You want to see a beautiful ecosystem? You want to see a a COVID-free environment where there are no infections. You want to see clean airs without smogs. You don't want air pollutants hanging up above us. Let's maintain the thick forest. Let us not uh, plant invasive or introduce a species of, of trees, but let us put the original native trees there. Let, let them make, let them grow old. No, let us see them grow old, much older than us. Alam nyo, sa Japan, they have a way of cutting trees without killing the trees and making use of timber without necessarily deforesting. So let us learn these things. Guys, if you can learn them in your generation and then teach the younger generations coming after you, then you are protecting the environment for the future. Write about them in your collegian. Uh, Make social presentations, make activities, no? Uh, bring them and use them as flagships. Campaign and tell them how beautiful these, these creatures are. We really do not know them. We don't appreciate them. But they are the ones that sustain a beautiful life for us. They sustain a beautiful environment for us. So 
Let us stop polluting our rivers and lakes by not making them our wastebasket and toilet. Clean up the plastics, take it away, campaign together, one university, move and go. Swipe clean the river systems and tell the local people, we have done this cleaning, can you continue and sustain it in your area? Adapt a segment of the river, clean a segment of the river, make that river clean and shining water. Okay, so let us join campaigns about environmental protection. There are friends about the problems and even rally for the approval of the total log ban. Anyway, it is very clear that even human populations have become victims of scrupulous cutting down of forest trees. Remember, these examples of Ormok and Cherry Hills are very, very old examples of already. We have more recent examples of flooding in Sierra Madre. Nice. I I grew up in Isabela in Santiago and I have never seen such a devastating flood as what was done recently in the Ulysses. We thought the Sierra Madre is intact and, and protected. Now the typhoons reveal the Sierra Madre is a crying old mountain range whose inner parts have been dug up and have been cut down. Why were there floods? Because no trees could hold the waters. Because the land has eroded. No tree could, uh, no land could suck the water down. So the soil had to flow down and destroy the lives of many, many people. As if they are not connected, they are very connected. Protect your forest and you'll get clean river systems protect your forest and you don't get floods. You will get minimal floods only because that is what we had in, I mean, I had, I had tiny flood experiences when I was a kid. Parang gumano lang sandali, baba na agad, tapos mga two inches lang yung flood. Tapos na. Kasi nagbukas yung dam. But now, the floods eat up the people. They drown the lives of a lot of people. They drown the livelihood. The farms and everything is gone. Why? Because we have destroyed the forest protectors. And that would be our mountains and forest areas. It has to be understood by every generation that the forest matter and the forests are protectors of the frogs and the other life living organisms. So we hope, Onka says, we hope you learned about frogs from me today. We hope you will be partners in protecting them because when we protect them, we protect our environment. And when we do, we also protect ourselves. Okay, so that ends my lecture.